Good evening and a uh, very warm welcome to the Sheldonian and to another in our series of distinguished lectures for the 21st century school. Uh, we're delighted to have tonight with us uh, Mohammed El Aryan. Mohammed's a, a dear old friend who uh, was here at the time he was doing his doctorate and I was doing mine. Uh, and he's someone who's had an absolute meteor meteoric rise uh, over the last years. He made the very sensible move of going from Cambridge to Oxford, uh, and his rise has been unstoppable ever since. Uh, he did his undergraduate uh, economics at Cambridge, he then came here and did the MPhil and DPhil, and it's great to see his MPhil supervisor uh, here tonight, and, uh, and then went on to have a illustrious career at the IMF, being uh, folklore has it still, the most rapidly rising star in the place, which is full of many stars. Uh, he, right at the time of the Asian crisis, uh, I think judged that public institutions wouldn't be the savior of the world, and left to go to Summonsmith uh, Barney Park City Group for a while, and then joined PIMCO, which was already a very significant bond investor uh, based in Los Angeles. Uh, in, 90, in 2006, he went to Harvard uh, and became the CEO of the Harvard Management Company uh, and is uh, well known in university endowment circles of getting the biggest return in the quickest amount of time. Uh, so he, he turned that endowment around and grew it to 35 uh, billion dollars. Uh, he then also showed his prescient vision by leaving uh, before the crisis hit and, um, and went back to PIMCO where he's now the CEO and uh, Joint Chief Investment Officer of PIMCO. Now PIMCO is uh, an investment manager which has assets which are about double the size of the total GDP of Africa. Uh, so it's about a trillion dollars uh, under management, I think 970 billion uh, dollars uh, under management. So it's not a small fund manager by any standards. Uh, and I imagine being a CEO of that and the CIO uh, comes with its understanding of the world and its challenges. Uh, and that's clearly what Mohammed has demonstrated. Mohammed is not only able to tweak the screens and uh, do the trades, as he obviously can do, uh, but also thinks about this in a very deep and intellectual way. And those of you that read the Financial Times will be aware that right through this crisis, he's been actually pressing. He also reflected this in his recent book, When Markets Collide, uh, which I should stress is available over the road at Blackwell's Bookshop, signed copies, which will be open till 7.30. Um, and uh, in that book, he really sees the underlying nature of the crisis, the pace of economic and technological change, uh, and how they intersect to create instability. Uh, it's a book which won the Goldman Sachs, Financial Times, and The Economist Best Book of the Year awards, and also the Wall Street Journal and New York Times uh, bestseller list books. So it's a book that has been very, very widely read, uh, and I think has helped those that read it carefully uh, save a bit of money and maybe even make some too. So uh, many people have a lot to thank for Mohammed. We're delighted that he's agreed to come to Oxford tonight and to share perspectives on how he sees the world going forward. Mohammed, it's with great pleasure that we welcome you. Let me start by saying what a huge pleasure and honor it is to be here. Um, thank you all for coming. It is also wonderful for me to see people that I haven't seen for a while, including, as Ian said, my former MPhil supervisor, which immediately made me think, did I submit that essay or not? <laughs> um, so thank you all for coming. Ian, a huge thanks to you for inviting me. We've known each other for 26, 27 years. Um, and I think I'm here because we're friends, uh, more than anything else. Um, I. Listening to my introduction made me think, reflect on, on your career at the bank in South Africa and now here. And what, you've, what you are doing at the James Martin School. And I'm going to say that because inadvertently, I'm going to be echoing a lot of the themes 
of the school. And I say inadvertently because there wasn't much coordination beforehand. And I'm going to be talking about issues that we, and critically it's we, because I'm very lucky to be part of a firm that spent a lot of time thinking about the future. When you're managing almost a trillion dollars of other people's money, you've got to look two and three corners ahead in order to position um, your client's money. So I'm going to be talking about a lot of thoughts that we have developed together and we debate almost on a daily basis. It's an even greater pleasure to be back in Oxford. Um, I don't know whether it's the one-way system or whether it's the driver's strange optimization <laughs> process, but coming in, I got taken for a wonderful tour of the city, um, <laughs> bringing back enormous memories. And when you reach my age, um, there's a secular element to the memories. You sort of look back and, and, and think, you know, you try to locate where you were in your life. When I came here at the age of 21, I came from three years at Cambridge, where economic, the economic tripos was about looking at the world from different perspectives. It was a very, very confusing three years. You started with neoclassical economics, and just as you started understanding it, it shifted completely to neo-Ricardian economics. Then you would go Keynesianism, then, then it would be Marxist economics. The result of which, you, you come out appreciating there's many different ways of looking at an issue, but not really being deep enough to follow any particular way all the way through. And I arrived at Oxford, where the economics was completely different. It was much more focused, but much, much deeper. And I remember my initial reaction at that point being one of almost hostility until I realized that you've got to combine both depth and breadth if you're going to understand the world. And I'm going to argue that this combination of depth and breadth is critical today because we are going through a major paradigm change in the global economy. We are accelerating structural changes that were ongoing, but someone pressed the fast forward button because of the crisis. And as yet, we do not fully understand quite where we're going, although certain elements are already clear. I'm also going to do something different from what's done at Oxford. At Oxford, I spent <coughs> wonderful hours discussing what should happen in the world. All of us had very strong views when I was here about what should happen in the world. I still have strong views about what should happen, but that's not what I, what I do in my day job. My day job, I have to think about what's likely to happen. And what I'm going to be talking about tonight is about what's likely to happen. Not what ought to happen, but what's likely to happen. Okay? And it's not about being pessimistic or optimistic. Okay? It's about trying to figure out where the global system is heading unless we get major interventions of some sort. With this preamble, let me tell you what I'm going to do. I'm going to take you on a journey. I'm going to start with the least controversial of what I'm going to be talking about this evening, which is where are we today in terms of the recovery from the global financial crisis. I'm then going to look forward to 2010 and beyond and argue that where we are today is a head fake. Okay. That we, in fact, the information content of where we are today isn't very high when you have to talk about where we're going to be tomorrow. And I'm going to step back and talk a little bit about where I think we're going to be tomorrow and beyond. I'm going to then argue that we are at the point of maximum confusion today. And because we are in the secular change, and we are at the point of maximum confusion, the institutions are not keeping up with the reality on the ground. And then I'm going to conclude 
by giving you a very specific example of what that means in my world. And talk is cheap, but what I'm going to be talking about today is actually being reflected in some major institutional changes that we are undertaking at PINCO, my firm, in order to position ourselves for this new world, what we call the new normal. If we had been smart, we would have trademarked that phrase. We, we're not that smart, okay? And therefore, it's now being used to mean very different things. What about the analytical tools? Forgive me, but I'm going to use a whole host of them. I'm going to use some traditional economics. I'm going to use behavioral finance. I'm going to talk about the theory of the international public good. I'm going to talk about the dynamics of, institute, of paradigm changes. And I'm also going to talk about organizational theory. So allow me this buffet of analytical tools that I believe are absolutely critical if we are to navigate these paradigm changes. What do I hope to leave you with? Three things. First and foremost, a feel that we are at an incredibly fluid time for the global economy. And that we don't quite have a full understanding of quite how consequential today and tomorrow is going to be. Second, I'm going to argue that there's a whole host of things that require research. That when we at PIMCO try to figure out and understand them, we, we, we get frustrated because we think that there isn't enough research done on some of these trends, that too much of the work is still backward looking. And finally, I'm going to leave you with the hope that Oxford being Oxford, that we will look to people in this room to help us better understand what we think are some consequential changes in the global economy. Let me start with the least controversial, where I can probably get 99.9% .9 agreement out there. Where are we today? We are in the midst of a classical cyclical bounce. We have had two massive interventions by governments, not because they wanted to, but because the cost of not doing so was perceived to be very high, which was a global depression. We've had the biggest stimulus of all time, of all time, operating through every policy you can think of, monetary and fiscal in particular. And that has not only avoided us going into a major depression after the financial crisis, but also gives us the sense of a classic cyclical bounce, a classic cyclical recovery. The cyclical recovery is being accentuated by the classic inventory cycle. And the result of that is no matter where you look around the world, the growth numbers are popping up. No matter where you look around the world, the high frequency numbers have turned positive. And there's a sense that things are going back to normal. In fact, that sense is so strong that financial markets that are, going to, are supposed to price not the global economy of today, but the global economy of tomorrow. Financial markets have already extrapolated well into 2010 this cyclical bounce. And financial markets today tell you that we're going to have a classic V-shaped recovery. And research tells you, well, the deeper you come down, the more you recover. And that is leading some to extend into 2011 and 2012. Yet, if you look at the longer term numbers, they're not reacting the way the higher frequency numbers are reacting. There's something more going on than a cyclical bounce. There's a yellow light shine that is flashing that say, be careful before you automatically extrapolate 20, the second half of 2009 
into 2010. In fact, the deeper you look at it, the more you realize that the financial crisis wasn't a flesh wound to the global economy. And I don't mean it in a Monty Python sense. I mean it in the real sense. And this was not a flesh wound to the global economy. That the financial crisis has done something very fundamental. To think about it, have the following image in your mind. The global system is based on the assumption of a very strong core and a crisis-prone periphery. That is how the global system is, is seen. That is how circuit breakers have been built. Circuit breakers in the global system protect the core from the periphery. Why? Because the core is strong and the <coughs> periphery is crisis-prone. What 2007 and 8 was about was not a crisis in the periphery. It was a crisis in the poor. The United States, where the crisis originated, the United States, where the crisis has been most intense, is at the core of the system. And therefore, when you shock the core, the issue should not be, oh, we normally go back to a V, because we don't shock the core that often. We have to step back and say, what are the consequences of shocking the core? And when you ask that question, suddenly 2010 and 2011 no longer look like a classic recovery. They no longer look at a V. 20 years ago, Charles Kimberberger talked about the public global goods that are produced by the core. And he cited five at that time. The core is the lender of last resort. The core is the buyer of last resort. The core is the supplier of a stable exchange rate system. The core is the catalyst for macro policy coordination. And the core is the provider of counter-cyclical capital. If Kindleberger was writing it today, he would add two more things in the globalized world. He would say two other public goods, global public goods, is who issues the true AAA piece of paper, the riskless benchmark that we price everything off. And he would say, secondly, who provides the deepest and most predictable financial markets that other countries are willing to outsource their financial needs. Up to the crisis, the United States was the unquestionable provider of all seven of these international public goods. However, when you shock the core of the system, the faith in these international public goods is shaken. And you cannot replace them overnight. There is no currency to take the role of the dollar at the center. There is no other source of internal demand to take over the role of the U.S. consumer as the buyer of everything. There is no other financial market that can play the role of Wall Street. There simply isn't a replacement for the weakened core. So when you look in 2010-2011, you have to live with the reality of a weakened core. And whatever day you pick up the Financial Times, you will see articles about the consequences of that. Pick it up today about the questioning of the role of the dollar. Pick it up about the Asians wondering who's going to provide growth for their exports. What the crisis has done, it has accelerated a shift from a unipolar global economy to a multipolar global economy. I have a six and a half year old daughter, and I'd rather she grows up in a multipolar global economy than a unipolar global economy. <coughs> but I'm really nervous that she's going to live in transition between from a unipolar to a multipolar. The journey and the destination are very different. The image I often use to describe this is think of a plane flying at a very high altitude 
with a single massive entry. That was what the global economy was in the run up to the crisis. The high altitude was very high GDP growth. The big engine was the US consumer. And the fuel was debt. And it doesn't take anybody to figure out that a massive engine fueled by debt is an unstable engine. Now we move into a different plane. We move into a plane that's going to fly at a much lower altitude. It's going to have multiple engines, much, much smaller, with the US being one, but with others also being there in systemic fashion. The Chinas, the Indians, the Brazils of the world. It is 2010, 2011, 2012. It's going to be about that transition from the single engine plane flying at a very high altitude to the multi engine plane flying at lower altitudes. And just think that if you were in a plane making that transition in flight, how you would feel about your journey. You wouldn't put your hand up and say, I want to do this, I want to do this. You'd say, hey, this is going to be hard to navigate. There is a lot of downside risk to that transition. It's very hard to navigate. No pilot quite knows how to do it. There is no book to tell you. There's going to be policy mistakes. Not because the policy makers are stupid, they are not but because they have very blunt tools to deal with the transition. And then there's going to be the hardest of all things for human beings, giving up entitlement. Giving up the rent that you collect by providing international public goods. So this is an inherently bumpy process. Thus the tagline that we're using at PIMCO, we are on a bumpy journey to a new normal. The third point that I want to make is this is, right now, the state of maximum confusion. We have left the old paradigm, but we haven't arrived at the new paradigm. In fact, there isn't full clarity about the new paradigm. Human beings tend to do things when you are in a paradigm shift and you are a point of maximum confusion you are automatically attracted to the old paradigm. Behavioral economics speaks to why that happens. Anchoring, the comfort with the familiar. So when you find yourself on a journey between paradigms and you are at a point of maximum confusion, you will romance the old paradigm. And if you doubt that, let me give you the example of what happens when the technology person turns up at my desk and says, Mohammed, it's time to migrate you to new technology. I say, no, thank you. I'm happy with my old technology. Go migrate everybody else in the firm first. I'm a dinosaur. And within two months, he comes back and says, we've migrated everybody else. It's your turn. And I say, no, thank you. And then that person picks up courage and says, you have no choice because we're going to stop supporting the old technology. Off I go on this journey to the new technology. There's a point in my journey where I don't, I haven't quite mastered the new technology and I really miss the old technology. At that point, typically I go to the tech person and say, bring me back my old technology. Okay. That is what the markets are doing today. That is what some policy makers are doing today. With the great exception of Mervyn King, his statement last August in a press conference when he said, Quote, it's about the level of stupid, it's not about the rate of change. Okay, it shows a much greater appreciation of the fundamental changes going on. So if you believe that 2009 is a head fake, if you believe that the underlying dynamics are much more complicated than a simple flesh wound, if you believe that it's normal for societies to get confused and to romance the old as if, as if to look forward to the new, what are the implications? 
And if you go through this analysis, the implications are really consequential. It means that at every level of society, we're going to have to address. The individual is going to have to address. The firms are going to have to address. National governments are going to have to address. And the multilateral system is going to have to address. When I say that, I immediately tend to get a reaction like, wow, you know, you're radical. What are you talking about? And I say, well, let me give you an example how everybody's doing this. Let's take the individual. Let's take the average American. The average American today is experiencing things that are very unfamiliar. They're experiencing an unemployment rate that is not only very high, but is projected to remain high. The official unemployment rate is at 10.2%. It has more than doubled in two years. The real measure of unemployment, what they call U6, also published by the, by the Bureau, by the authorities, is at 17.5. 17.5 percent of the people in the United States are either unemployed or unemployed. That is a major shock to the average American. The social contract that the average that the average American knows is extremely flexible labor markets, and therefore high unemployment does not persist. You know the old story, you lose your job in Oklahoma, you go to Texas. Labor is incredibly mobile. Well, suddenly today, the unemployment, the unemployment problem is both protracted and structural in nature. It is making the average American look at the social contract and say, wait a minute, that's supposed to be Europe. That's not supposed to be the US. The unemployment welfare system, the social safety nets, are not built for that world. And that is why the politicians have to extend over and over again the unemployment term, benefit term. The average American is also feeling it in the savings for their retirement. Even though markets have come back, they are nowhere near where they thought they were before. And suddenly the average American who is working and has saved is starting to be influenced by the unemployed and those who have lost jobs. Firms. I am yet to meet one CEO who, who, who tells me that the recession is over and we're going to invest for the future. That's not what they're saying. What they're saying is we have to resize our business. Governments. Governments know they cannot accept a system that privatizes massive gains and socializes massive losses. They simply cannot accept that. And therefore, they are on a journey towards higher regulation, the nationalization of regulation, which is another way of saying deglobalization of the market. And they have found themselves in a situation where in typical crisis man management, they did lots of things they never imagined that they would ever do, and they're not quite sure what the consequences of all that are. And of course, then the multilateral level. Why is the G20 replacing the G7 so quickly? It is not because the G7 is saying, I'm going to give up my entitlement. It's because people have recognized that unless you have the key emerging economies in the room, you cannot talk about multilateral co co cooperation. What I'm suggesting to you is that these changes are already going on, but they are going on at every level and in a way that people still don't appreciate quite how consequential that change is. There's a reason for that. One is that it's hard to recognize paradigm changes because most of the time paradigms don't change. Whenever someone comes to you and says, this time is different, your reaction should be, yeah, sure. Because most of the time, mean reversion is incredibly powerful. But every once in a while, it is a paradigm shift. There's another reason, and here I'm going to go into the research that has done, been done on successful firms, which is that firms find it very difficult 
and, and by extensions to individuals and governments, find it very difficult to address the paradigm shift. Don So at the London Business School has spent a number of years looking at successful firms. Okay, these are firms, companies with the best initial conditions. And asking the question, why is it that they cannot navigate paradigm changes? Let me give you a few examples. And this comes from his book called The Upside of Turbulence. In the 60s, the tire industry in the United States was dominated by four <coughs> very profitable firms. Incredibly profitable. They controlled the whole of the U.S. market. They had massive R&D programs. And they were comfortable. Michelin in Europe introduces the radial tire. Michelin, with this disruptive technology, takes over the marketplace in Europe. And Michelin announces they're coming to the United States. So think about it. You have companies with very good initial conditions. You have a paradigm shift that's clearly identified. What did they do? Within a year, most of them were either bankrupt or had to merge in crisis mode. Why? Because they recognized the paradigm shift and they went into what's called active inertia. They went into doing more of what they did before. That was their response. Why? Because whether we like it or not, companies, families, any group of society has a whole set of internal commitments Okay, that is very difficult to break. So you end up doing more of what you're doing before, even though the paradigm shift means you should be doing something different. IBM, with the introduction of the PC. What did IBM do? They produced a better mainframe computer. Okay. There are many, many examples that tell you how difficult it is to navigate these paradigm shifts. That's why they are not orderly. That's why one has got to think carefully about how to do it. I suggested that, that I, the last part of my, comp my, my discussion would, would, would say, what does that mean for my world? Okay. And I want to give you a sense that this is not about words. This is about a conviction at PIMCO that you've got to have the first mover advantage when it comes to paradigm shifts. It affects how we think about investment, you'd expect that, but it also affects about how we think of organizing our people, our resources, our technology. So let me give you a simple example to show you how consequential what I'm suggesting is. What does it take to be a successful long-term investor? It only takes three things. It takes a view on asset allocation. Okay, where do you want to be? Do you want to be in equities in the US? Do you want to be in equities in Europe? That's, that's the conventional view of one thing it takes. You have to have the right allocation among different opportunities. The second thing it takes is you have to have the right vehicle. You can have the right allocation, but if you don't find the right vehicle to express that allocation, then you haven't done anything. And the third thing it takes is good risk management, proactive risk management. If you get these three things right, okay, your chances of being a successful investor goes up exponentially. If indeed we are as we, as we believe we are at Pinkle. If indeed we are on a bumpy journey to a new destination, then all three elements suddenly become much trickier. Let's take asset allocation. It's not just about targeting the world of tomorrow. Okay? Targeting the multipolar world as opposed to targeting the unipolar world. That's the easy answer. The much more complicated answer is that you've got to recognize that asset classes 
are going to be incredibly unstable in terms of an analytical distinction. For example, today, there are many people in the US who say, I want to invest in the US, and therefore I'm buying the S&P. I'm buying domestic equities. Yet 50% of the profits of the S&P companies come from outside. So what are you buying? Are you buying domestic equities, or are you buying international equities? Many people buy commodities on the view that they are not correlated as highly to equities. And yet commodities behave with a very high equity value. In a paradigm shift, the asset classes become incredibly unstable in terms of the characteristics and the correlations. And what you have to do as an investor is to give up the short term of an asset class and go back and ask the fundamental question, why am I being paid as an investor? And you're being paid as an investor to take, to support, to underwrite a risk factor. And asset classes are nothing more than a combination of risk factors. But if you're going to be a good investor, you've got to go a step earlier in the value chain and ask a different question, which is what risk factor do I want to be exposed to and where is it valued? Second issue, vehicles. Surely once you get the first question right, then you can just go and find a vehicle. In a paradigm change, vehicles become very unstable because firms become unstable. <coughs> we are on the verge of a major consolidation of the investment management company industry. Why? First, the cost of doing business is going up. Second, there's tremendous fee pressure because the, the industry has disappointed. So people are not ready to pay for disappointment. And thirdly, some companies were very hard hit last year and haven't yet felt the full year impact of the hit they got last year. So suddenly, the vehicle itself becomes a variable, not a parameter. And finally, risk management. I used to live in a very simple world. Okay? The world that I grew up in is, is diversification will do everything for you. Diversification will deliver returns. Diversification will manage risk. And as long as you diversify, you're okay. In the world that I'm talking about, diversification remains necessary but it's no longer sufficient. In the world I'm talking about, in a paradigm shift, you better identify your tails, your bad events, and you better ask the question, can I hedge cheaply my tails? Tail management becomes a key component to supplement diversification. So even when you reduce it to the very simple issue of what does it mean for an investor? The consequences are significant. And I would suggest to you that if you translate it to your space, they will be equally consequential. So where does all this leave us? It may look like we're in the midst of a cyclical recovery. It may look like the markets and, the policy, and some policy makers are comfortable to extend that into 2010, 2011, but that would be a mistake. What we are in the midst of is an accelerated realignment of the global economy. It is understandable that there's a lot of confusion out there. That is what behavioral finance will tell you. It is understandable that firms find it difficult to adjust Again, that's what studies on organizational elements of firms will tell you. But I would suggest to you that arguing that things are not different are much harder today because the shock visibly occurred at the core of the international global system. And one has got to ask the question, what does a shock at the core of the international finance system mean? And it means that we are on this bumpy journey to a new normal.
What would it require to navigate it? One is better analytical tools, and as I suggested, there are many things we don't fully really understand today. We're not good at dealing with levels. Okay? We're much better with dealing with flows. We're not good with dealing with major shifts in the center of gravity of the global economy. We don't know how to replace something with nothing. We haven't done that before. There's lots and lots of questions out there that we don't know fully. So the key is to be adaptable and agile. And let me end with one of my favorite stories that I, think I again was exposed to by Donald Saul at the London Business School. I suspect very few of you will remember the very famous heavyweight fight in Zaire in the mid-70s. It was called the Rumble in the Jungle. And what they did is they brought Muhammad Ali and George Foreman to fight the heavyweight fight in Zaire. Anybody who has watched late night TV in the United States will know who George Foreman is. He sells barbecues today. Okay? He's massive. He entered the fight undefeated and an incredible um, number of knockouts because he was so powerful and it was very difficult to knock him down. Muhammad Ali was the aging boxer, incredibly agile, float like a butterfly and sting like a bee was his phrase. And the markets looked at this, the expert looks at this, and they say, well, you're going to put this aging guy in the same ring as this incredibly powerful younger person, it's very clear who's going to win. Foreman is going to knock Ali out. All that, that Foreman has to do is connect once and that's it. And it was clear okay, that the market had expressed it very strongly. In the event Ali won, shocking everybody. Now, a lot of research has been done into how did he do this. First, there was a good bit of risk management. They had a plane on the tarmac in Zaire, ready to fly him out to Europe, just in case he did get hit. So there was a good bit of risk management. But there was also an appreciation that Ali was facing a paradigm shift, and that he could not go into active inertia. He could not train more of what he trained before. It wasn't enough to be agile. You had to be adaptable as well. It didn't mean giving up on what he did. It meant doing something in addition. So they completely altered his training. The training consisted of getting convicts, ex-convicts, ex and putting them in the ring with Ali, and getting Ali beaten up every single day. Okay? And then when, when the fight came, everybody expected that the minute the fight would start, Ali would start running around the ring, floating like a butterfly. Instead, Ali got, did the one thing that everybody said he should never do. He put his hands up, covered his face, and went back on the ropes. Why did he go back on the ropes? To defuse the blows he was getting. And the person who was expected to float around the ring stood there and took a hell of a beat and waited. And then when Foreman got tired, the old Ali came back and he knocked out Foreman and won the fight. It wasn't just about agility, it was about mixing agility and adaptability. And I will leave you with that thought. It is those of you who can do that that are going to navigate best this bumpy journey to the new normal. Thank you.